Hello and welcome to the first episode of the new weekly podcast for private investors, Portfolio Matters. Now, ideally, Richard and I would like to do this in person, but like the rest of the world, we are currently in lockdown and are having to do this over Zoom. So I hope you will bear with us while we uh, suffer under lockdown. Now, what can you expect to find in the Portfolio Matters? podcast. Well, each week we will cover world events as they affect financial markets and the assets you might like to consider trading. Uh, We will run through a checklist which looks at the prices of various asset classes and how they've changed over the week and give you our thoughts on those changes. Um, We will look at our own portfolios and update you on how we're doing. And this podcast will be very much rooted in our own experience of trying to manage our pensions in this, these crazy markets. Um, we will then do, the, at the start of every month, which includes this week, we will look at various cycles. Um, then we will each pitch to the other an investment idea and the other one doesn't know what is coming. So this should hopefully be, be entertaining. Um, there will then be um, a small section called My Worst Trade, where we talk about trades which have gone disastrously wrong and what we learned from them. And I hope that if you enjoy this podcast and become a regular listener, that you will consider phoning in and sharing with the audience um, a trade of your own and what you learned from it. Um, Details of how to contact us can be found in the description on YouTube. Um, After that, uh, Richard, who is our resident expert on all things COVID, will be talking about latest developments in health. And this week we will have a book review. Um, So without further ado, let's skip to the disclaimer. Richard, take it away. Thank you very much, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Great. Okay, so weekly events. Now, in the market, the markets have been extraordinary this week, and I think this year is going to be very volatile. It seems to me we're in the late stages of a bubble. The um, FTSE has been up every day this week. I am up 3.2% over the last four and a half days, which is absolutely absurd. Um, Richard, I take it you have also had a great week. Keith, I'm up uh, a very similar amount to you. Uh, I am up uh, 3.1%, slightly trailing. And as you say, an extraordinary week of huge moves in share prices. So world events that caught my eye um, were, first of all, the, um, the Democrats in the US taking the Senate which means that the Democrats will have the ability to massively increase fiscal stimulus. Um, Given the amount of um, fiscal stimulus we've already had and the amount of money printing, that means an absolute avalanche of um, government bonds coming into the market next year, which is potentially inflationary, um, but it will put money in in people's pockets. It will support the economy. And frankly, it has to be good for equities. You know, in the short term, in the medium term, who knows? But you know, with that amount of money printing, you have to fear that inflation will pick up. Richard? So I just got a comment on the US payrolls, non-farm payrolls, which came out uh, just under an hour ago, Keith. Um, and the headline in the financial press is huge December payrolls miss 140 thousand jobs lost, worst month since April. And I think the non the payroll participation rate in the US is now about 
yeah. uh, with which uh, I think the markets are completely unfazed by. Gold is down uh, counterintuitively. Yeah. Uh, the next one I, I noticed was um, the obvious one, Bitcoin is continuing to fly in a way that is, yeah. uh, is extraordinarily, extraordinarily fast. And um, even though I am invested in it, one has to wonder if it's riding for a large fall. Well, the trouble is, Richard, that like all these things, it's a question of timing. And the way to maximise your return in Bitcoin is to hold your nose and hang on and wait until it peaks, which can be an incredibly uncomfortable experience. But the thing is, you have no idea when it's going to peak. It could peak at a million dollars a coin. You know, so... Yeah. Uh, and, and not have too much of it, so you can hold on. Absolutely. Um, other things that caught my eye were the OPEC plus agreement, which was absolutely extraordinary. So Saudi Arabia basically surprised the world and other OPEC members by saying that it was going to cut a million barrels from output going forward. So it was going to allow other OPEC members to increase their performance but it would actually over, um, balance that and cut a million barrels, which would re result in OPEC production actually being lower going forward, which of course is massively um, supportive of the oil price, which is shot up. Um, and frankly, I don't really know what it's trying to achieve and that what that does, it supports um, shale producers in the US by supporting the oil price and allows shale companies which might otherwise go bust to survive to fight again in the uh, when the oil price picks up later in the year. But in the short term, that is very good for oil prices and for oil companies. Um, uh, I've, also, uh, so, sorry, sorry, Keith. So, uh, so I've uh, got a couple of updates on COVID as I, I noticed this morning. So London has declared a major incident in that the health service is is unable to cope and the um i think it just basically puts everybody on a on a higher level of uh, alert and, and reduces any uh, non-essential treatments the um apparently the the case rate in london is something like one in 30 individuals are now infected mm. which is extraordinary and the I, I saw a quick snippet this morning it didn't really read the I haven't read the detail that the Pfizer vaccine appears to be effective on both the UK variant, which is spreading more rapidly, and the South African variant, which has more mutations. So that's good news. Finally, some good news. Well, I look forward to us being able to meet for in person and have a cup of tea. Yeah, or a glass of wine, Keith. <laughs> The other thing is Brexit finally went live and I noticed today in the Financial Times they were talking about the French imposing stricter customs checks for Monday. So I remain bearish on sterling. I think we haven't yet really felt the effects <coughs> of um, Brexit and the increased red tape. Um, there's obviously chaos in Washington, but nobody, the financial markets don't seem to care at all. No. Um, but I think it, Trump having um, taken one of the measures of success of his presidency are, as being the performance of the stock market, it is very noticeable how the stock market really doesn't seem to care very much about Mr. Trump and is, uh, seems to be indifferent to his leaving. The stock market um, is... Uh, is operating in an alternative reality. We just don't quite know which one it is. Yes. Well, there's a lot of money printing going on. I think it's all ending up in the stock market. Yeah. Talking of which, the other thing that caught my eye during the week was uh, Elon Musk is now apparently the richest man in the world. And Tesla has been up every week. It was up every day this week. It was up 7% yesterday. Um, and, um, Tesla is valued at over one million dollars per car produced, whereas GM is valued at around about four thousand dollars per car produced. And GM has announced it wants to take Tesla on in the electric car space. 
Volkswagen's electric cars are rapidly approaching production and Apple has announced it's going to produce an electric car. So, And China has a new electric car company, I believe, called NIO, N-I-O, right. which presumably will be competing on the world stage. Yes, but as long as all those competitors are remain in the future, people can hope that Tesla will be take over the world. Yes. Um, okay, is there anything else that caught your eye this week, Richard, or should we move on to the checklist? Let's move on, Keith. Right, so let me try and... You'll have to forgive our um, technical inabilities here, as I... Um, Richard, actually, can you... <laughs> allow sharing. <laughs> Presumed. So one of the things that I personally struggle with is that I look at um, the prices of various assets all the time, but I, I fail to actually think about them and act on the information. So one of the things I do is I have a checklist, which I fill in every week and it forces me to think about things. So if we go through these, this week, copper went up a further 5% to uh, $3.70 a pound, wow. um, which is, again, a new high since 2011. And the price is much higher than throughout the whole of the last economic cycle after 2011, when the world economy remains depressed. Now, this is clearly on the back of Chinese stimulus, but I am very sceptical that this is sustainable in the, in the long term, uh, medium term. The, um, when, what happened last cycle was that copper shot up on the back of Chinese stimulus and then drifted off over the next five years. And I fully expect that to be the case this time, but where the price goes in the short term is anyone's guess. Yep. Um, iron ore up an amazing almost 9% this week. And um, when we do the weekly portfolio review, you will see I sold my sole iron mining share. Um, and of course, I'm now about, it's, the share price is now about 10% above where I sold it. But I, I don't regret it. So the iron ore price is also very elevated. Frankly, it seems that every financial asset price is elevated at the moment. WTI, which is um, the US oil benchmark, um, that was up 5% on the back of OPEC. Gold has had a very poor day today, which brings it back down to flat on the week. Um, I suspect that is because equity markets are doing so well, people are selling gold to speculate in other assets, such as Bitcoin, which is up th an amazing 32% of the week on the week. Um, Richard will be happy. Thank you, Keith. Um, so the all FTSE all share is up 5.7%. Um, so the all shares had a better week than either Richard or I. The S&P 500 is up 1.3%. Yes. Sterling is down 0.7%. Um, as I think the market begins to appreciate the costs of Brexit. Moving on. Um, no change in UK base rates or the Fed funds rate, both of which are essentially at a rock bottom. What I thought was very interesting was that the UK yield curve, curve has moved up quite sharply. So having been doing nothing for quite a long time, you'll see at the long end, we had quite sharp movements. So given that the economy is going nowhere, we have lockdown. I'm not quite sure what that is telling us. Maybe the market is becoming concerned about the fact that further lockdown will result in more fiscal stimulus and more money printing. I think one, of, some, one of the things to notice there, Keith, is in your percent change, you've got the absolute change, but the relative change is like for the 10 year, it, it has more, it's 100% increase. 
And for the 20 years, yes. 30 year, it's between 10 and 15 percent increase on the week, yes. which is an extraordinary large relative movement. Yes, I think I've got the chart up of the uh, UK. So this is um, 31 year guilt, essentially, it's the 2052. Right. <clears throat> um, and you can see that the price is now off its highs. So it's drifting off. You can see the spike down this week, but it peaked in March. And I think this is something to watch because this is what this is saying is that long bond rates are rising. Um, and we don't know whether this will continue. And if long bond yields continue to rise, that will mean borrowing costs are rising, which will have very negative effects for house builders and for um, everyone who has debt. And lots of corporations are very heavily indebted. So going back, um, the other things that um, on this chart are UK inflation is very low. So it's monthly figures from the Bank of England, but um, the um, RPI, though, actually those are the wrong way around. RPI should be 0 0.9 and uh, CPI is 0 0.3. Okay, uh, Richard, any comments before we move on? You've got, you're on mute, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the next slide, Keith. Right, okay, so let me, um, bring up my personal review of the week okay so i've had a very good week how sustainable that is i don't know so i've actually done a bit of trading this week and what i've been doing is trying to spare sell my um low quality let's put it that way um, speculative mining shares, which are illiquid, while there is a lot of liquidity in the market. Um, so I have, um, my biggest sale of the week was the um, Ukrainian iron ore miner for Expo, which uh, I've done incredibly well on. But, and the thing I would emphasize here is that I'm sort of breaking all the uh, traditional investment guidance which is you run your winners. But in the case of um, for Expo, which is an iron ore miner, I think that fails to take account of the supply situation. Everyone is, uh, assumes that um, these very high oil, iron prices can continue, but I think it's only a question of time before there's a supply response and iron ore prices come down. So um, the other shares I sold were a uh, Antalya Mining, which is a high cost copper producer in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, Adriatic metals have a, a, mine, a silver mine, but no output and um, very liquid. Castillo Copper <laughs> has a, the prospect of a copper mine in um, in Australia, and it shares it again, it's a tiny company. It's a, I think the market cap is about 10 million. And I made 40% in a month, and I think that's enough. <laughs> uh, Makango Resources uh, has um, a mine, a rare earth metals mine, again, incredibly illiquid, um, somewhere, and the, the mine is somewhere in Africa, and I forget. <laughs> I think, frankly, the um, purists uh, amongst the audience will be despairing of my complete lack of knowledge of what this company does. But I think all that really matters is it does rare earths and rare earths are in demand. So in the course of a month, I've made 44%. Um, the only loser was a, um, a small gold miner called Charat Gold, which has operations in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Obviously those two have been fighting and the, um, the share price has drifted off. And frankly, that, that gets stuck in the too difficult category. I've got absolutely no idea what's going on there. So um, looking at your table overall, Keith, it's a very good performance, so, so well done. So I thought I'd just provide a bit more color in 
frankly, the one trade of these that really mattered. Um, all the, uh, the bottom five stocks are all, you know, very small positions. But the position in Fuexpo was actually quite large and meaningful and became so. Mm -hmm. So here you see the long-term share price of Fuexpo with my purchases in green and my sales in red. And what I would like to emphasize in this chart is that whenever the share price shoots up, it comes back down to earth again. So in 2017, you'll see it shot up and then drifted off and the same in 2019. And I just don't believe that the, or, the iron ore price can remain elevated for a long period of time. So during the sell-off in March, I bought for Expo on the hope of Chinese stimulus, um, which came through. And I have now sold, and clearly I have sold slightly too early. It um, announced a special dividend just after I started selling, which has sent the share price through the roof. So as of this morning, it's, share, it's um, uh, selling at £3.50 a share. And given I got out at £3.03 on average, I'm not looking terribly clever, but... Um, I think you have to sell at some stage. Yeah, uh, well done, Keith. Very, very good result. So, Richard, uh, have you sold anything this week? Yes, I have, have Keith. Let me share my screen. So I uh, decided to exit from the uh, positions that I had in that were related to uh, rare earth elements and uh, battery technology and uh, electrification. So moving on, I made two purchases this week, uh, BP, and I put a chart in of BP. Now I'm not a chartist, I don't pretend to have any superior knowledge, but I do like to look at charts to see where the price is relative to where it has been. And I've got three indicators here. I've got on this chart, I've got volume at the bottom, uh, momentum, in the middle and a moving average conversion to divergence at, the, at the top. And a couple of things intrigue me about BP. Um, it is on a dividend yield of around about 5%. The momentum is above zero and it hasn't really been above zero for the whole duration of this chart, which goes back to 2019. Uh, but here it is significantly above zero and it's turning up, uh, sorry, turning up momentum. And the MACD is also turning up. And the oil price has been very depressed. And my view is that as the world gets back to normal, the oil price will, will rise and the uh, BP share price will rise with it. So the, the moving average convergence divergence is a trend following momentum indicator which shows the relationship between two moving averages and so is this a new new policy of yours or have you followed this for a while i followed it for a while um i actually i tend to use um i tend to just look at these and if if, if there's a clear divergence between what i think the chart the price chart is saying and what the indicator is saying then it makes me stop and think but Otherwise, I find that, I mean, you can try and say, well, like, let's, pick a, let's pick the sell signal here. Well, the sell signal here, by the time it became apparent, the price had already dropped from 500 roughly to 250. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's a difficult one to actually use for timing, but it is a, it is a reasonable one for, for here. We would have gone in at this point, but by which time most of the rise. But it's a reasonable one for telling you what the general um, mm. market mood is, I think. Okay. Well, of course, um, as we covered in my, uh, in the review, the performance review of 2020, I have a vast holding in BP, um, bought at various stages through the year. Yeah. And suffice to say, the share price is still not back up to the point where <laughs> where I bought my first stake. So if you buy it now, you clearly bought it at a better level than when I got in. Now I did buy some right down at two pounds, but um, you know. But then Keith's timing is so difficult, isn't it? Your Forex yeah. Pro 
the timing, your timing was almost perfect on it. Yeah. Okay, so let me share. Uh, sorry, Richard, have you got any more purchases you want to talk about? My only other purchase is my two minute pitch, Keith. Right, aha. Very interesting. Right, so my, let me share my screen. I, uh, my purchases of the week fall into the category of small speculative positions and stocks that were, are not of the first tier. So I bought a lot of oil companies earlier in the year and I bought the good ones. <laughs> and now they've all shot up in price. One of the problems is I have is I find it very difficult to buy stocks that have shot up in price. So <laughs> I'm now sort of bottom fishing and you could well um, accuse me of, uh, you know, buying the rubbish, which, which may well be true. So Pantheon Resources is a company with which I have some history and it's not a great history. Needless to say, a few years ago, they had what were meant to be marvellous discoveries in uh, Texas and the share price shot up to uh, £1.30. And then it turned out these marvellous discoveries were not marvellous discoveries at all. And the share price collapsed to 10p. And it has since repositioned itself as an Alaskan explorer and bought various licenses there. And that is currently looking very good. So anyway, I have once more bought a ticket for the journey. Okay, well done. Park Made is a UK company with some gas assets in Holland, which provides steady income and various licenses in the North Sea. Now, it's one of those companies, it was set up by an entrepreneur who really hardly communicated with the market at all. And so if you look at um, the annual report, they do have actually very extensive interests and potentially if these were to be, de be developed, this could be quite a big um, resource. However, um, historically, they have a difficult relationship with the market. So anyway, for all those reasons, the share price is quite depressed, which I like. <laughs> um, Caledonian Mining Corp is a um, Zimbabwean gold miner, which has shot up with all the gold miners, but is a name I don't own. So as the gold price has drifted off a bit, I bought some. Uh, Blencoe is interesting. So Blencoe is an absolutely tiny cap company. It has a market cap of 8 million. Right. And frankly, I have struggled to buy two grand's worth of this stock. <laughs> and what it, it is developing a graphite mine. Uh, right. Now, when we talk about uh, clean energy, yeah. There's a lot of graphite in batteries and it claims to have the only mine in development for large flake graphite. Right. So the, obviously there's a long way to go and you would need to develop the mine, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that's potentially interesting and is one that I intend to hold for a period. Where is where, the where mine piece, do you know? Um, somewhere in darkest Africa. <laughs> um, I, I will look it up if and when I decide to uh, do a two minute pitch on it. I, I did, uh, you know, I have gone through the annual report, etc. But the uh, exact details escape me. Needless to say, it's a tiny position and very difficult to trade. Okay. Um, but a bit but, of fun. Yeah, a bit of fun. So, but my biggest holding new purchase is a mystery stock, which I will be pitching to Richard in the two minute pitch coming up. Next up on the agenda is to look at the various cycles we monitor over um, months. And um, we have, I produced some clocks which show where we are in various cycles. Um, so if I share my screen, so the first and most important cycle we monitor is the inflation cycle. Now, this is a cycle that plays out over the course of decades. 
And since 1982, when Volcker raised interest rates in the US to 15% and ended the 1970s high in stagflation, we have been in a declining inflation environment. And the question is, have we come to the end of that 40 year cycle? So we don't have deflation because inflation is low. So it's, um, as we saw earlier in the UK, inflation as measured by RPI is 0.9% and by CPI it's 0.3%. So we've got very mild inflation. Um, the question is, will inflation start to pick up given the enormous amounts of, of money printing? Now, I think the only thing you can say is right now, there are very few signs of that. And so this is something we should continue to monitor. But right now, there's no indications of inflation, in fact, of even mild inflation. Yeah. Um, now, the next one is the business cycle. Now, in theory, the equity cycle should follow the business cycle. So when we have a recession, equities um, are depressed because corporate earnings are depressed. And what is really remarkable about the current cycle is that the two are completely divorced. Yeah. So the business cycle is we're up from our lows. So actually on this, we'll probably be about 630. But we're still very much in a trough and we will not be coming out of recession until all the lockdowns are off and hopefully the vaccine has had an effect. But unfortunately, I don't think this chart is necessarily a very good guide to the market because the market has absolutely shot up and seems to be divorced from economic fundamentals. Yeah. We'll have to wait a whole cycle, Keith, before it realigns itself. Well, it'd be very interesting to see what happens from now on. I mean, I think the only thing you can say is as the um, economy recovers and equity markets are so high, then returns will probably be quite subdued. So equities might not crash, but they're not going to give you a great return. Um, now, the commodity cycle. Now, again, the commodity cycle should be... Um, in synchronized with the business cycle, but it's not. We're seeing these absolutely extraordinary movements in iron and copper when economic activity as measured by GDP remained depressed. And I think that is very much due to Chinese stimulus. But as we know, Chinese stimulus tends to be one-off boosts. And once that one-off boost has passed through the system, I fully expect the price of copper and other industrial metals and such as iron ore to come back off. So frankly, I think we're very close to peak. Any thoughts, Richard? Um, well, yes, I suppose, Keith, the commodity cycle is, if you, if, you, if you separate it from the business cycle at the moment, then where we, are, where we are now is that we're at a point where you would expect every every company that is able to do so to invest in increasing the, the, the amount of resource they can access to sell. So yeah. we should be seeing, as you've got on your chart, this big expansion in mine capacity and so forth. The thing is, it's happened so quickly. I mean, it's happened in the last six months. And whereas it takes a mine, a mine you know, maybe many, many years, half a decade or a decade to come on stream, a new mine. So the cycle is, is running at a totally different rate yes to to what can actually be achieved in the real world in terms of production so we may be that it may almost be that we have a sort of sine wave within the cycle that is fluctuating oscillating quite quickly and that it sort of starts to throw off it actually throws off the um the plans of of, of the extractive companies because they won't really know where on earth they are in the cycle. Will they have the confidence to invest if they think that there's a there's a bubble? I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm simply speculating that 
a lot of what we thought was were truisms and fairly fixed and steady relationships are currently breaking down and the world seems to be get, becoming more chaotic. Yeah, the one thing I'd say is there's a report in the FT this week about junior iron ore miners right. and how they were picking up abandoned projects by the big mining companies, which the big mining companies had considered to be too small for their notice or had too high a break-even price. And they are bringing these online and they're currently making absolutely extraordinary amounts of profit. So there are lots of these small projects which do have the potential to increase capacity. Yeah. Um, and as we've talked about previously, I mean, iron ore in particular, there's loads of iron ore. It's a question of can you get it out? In, um, and I, with the incentives that are currently there, so these iron ore miners are currently making over $100 a tonne where they'd expected to make 10 or $20 a tonne. And so there's enormous incentive to um, increase production, and I f expect them to do so. So I think we are in, a, in some sort of speculative commodities bubble. I, I, I think what's actually happening is that there's a spillover from the financial sector, the, the stock markets, and the bond markets. And I think there's a spillover into the commodity market. Yeah. And... I think the commodity market will now continue to go up until the stock market stops going up and possibly further if people try and exit the market, the stock market goes to the commodity market. But it doesn't, it doesn't make any economic sense, which means that if you are in this sector, you need to be very acutely aware that it may reverse very quickly. Absolutely. But there is a lot of money to be made from it if you're... Well, I I think you've just proved that with your um, your little speculations, Richard. So the last one is the oil cycle. Now, right now, the oil market is a very artificial market because OPEC are completely in control. Um, but if we look at investment on a, if we look, so these dials basically tell us where the oil market is now. But the oil cycle is a five year cycle. So if you want to bring a big deep sea, um, deep water well into production, it will take you a long time uh, to find it, to develop, get the permits, develop it and bring it online. So if you look at investment, investment is currently at all time lows. So that means that in five years time, there are going to be very few projects coming online. So I expect a shortage of oil. Um, and when we look at inventories right now, invent in the US, in there are consistent inventory drawdowns, despite the fact that the um, American GDP, world GDP, and world economic activity is depressed. So what that's telling you is OPEC are being very successful in cutting supply and in order to balance the market oil is having to come out of inventories but having said that as you see in the third dial inventory dial uh, inventory levels are still elevated inventory levels are still above where they were at the start of 2020 so as long as that remains the case then we don't have a problem with oil availability so what this is saying is that we're going to have a problem in about in five years time, but nobody's investing in oil. In a few years time, there will be a shortage on based on current demand. Um, but at the same time, currently inventory levels are high, but falling. But within the next six months, inventories will return to their historic levels, in which case either OPEC will have to increase supply or the oil price will start rising dramatically. What is the capacity for OPEC to increase supply to pick up any future shortfall, Keith? Do you know? Um, well, I haven't actually um, yet appraised myself of the um, recent developments, but going into this week, they claim to have cut oil production by 7.7 .7 million barrels. Now, I've looked at the numbers 
And when they claim to have cut 7.7 .7 million bells, those are from elevated levels from last February, when, if you remember, there was an oil price war going on between Saudi Arabia and Russia. And Saudi had artificially ramped up production, selling oil from um, its surplus tanks, yeah. i.e. not from live production, in order to drive the price down um, to take on Russia, uh, but get market share from Russia. So actually, if you look at average production in December from OPEC with their average production in 2019, it seemed to me they're actually only down about five and a half million, which is still a very large number and clearly shows that OPEC are in control of this market. Yeah. But it's not the 7.7 .7 million they claimed. Well, it seems to me that um, the, the world is anticipating that oil consumption is going to reduce far more dramatically and quickly than it actually can in reality, because uh, what's, how, how much, um, if, you, if we went back to the economy as it was in February, just before the lockdowns, and how much of that consumption has been taken out through a move to uh, wind and solar power, well, my guess is very little. And when the economy opens back up, that's the situation that will pertain for some time to come. I completely agree. And that's why I have a vast amount of uh, oil companies in my portfolio, which, which sad, sad to say, have not actually been great performers up until this point. You know, when you brought up the BP share price, the reality is it didn't do very well last year. And so you've got in at quite a good time. OK, so moving on. Um, well, coming up next are the two minute pitches and neither Richard or I. So we are now going to pitch to each other an investment idea. And before we do so, let me reiterate the uh, disclaimer that these, these are not, this is not investment advice. Do your own research. Yeah. And um, these, this whole program, we talk about positions we own or have owned and do have an economic interest in. So do your own research. My two minute pitch is BT, good old <laughs> British Telecom. My God. Now, as you see, they have been on unre unrelenting downtrend. Yes. 2016. And depending on how you draw that, that nice downsloping line that I put in, you could say that, I, that they have broken out of that downtrend. So the, there are various features. Their broadband was renowned for being appalling, I believe. I certainly had it and it was appalling, but it is far, far better now. In fact, it is, I would say from personal experience, their broadband is faultless. And we have a WhatsApp group from my neighborhood and a lot of people are on Virgin and the WhatsApp group is full of people saying, is your Virgin broadband down? Has your Virgin broadband gone wrong? And of course, with people working more and more at home, broadband is becoming increasingly important. It is in the running to be a significant 5G player, next generation. The pension deficit is very well known and is reflected in the share price. They are moving their focus to higher value global communications and growth technologies. They have a dividend yield of about 5% and the prospective price earnings of about 8%. Now, if you look at the prospective price earnings of, for example, Zoom, uh, I don't know what, the, actually, I don't know what the prospective price earnings of Zoom is. I don't know if it's even a positive number um, or whether it's a, how many noughts it's got after. But in terms of actually getting a, an economic return from the business, BT is a totally different kettle of fish. And it's trading at a third of the value of its net assets. Now, I have had, been looking at the um, global business briefing that they prepared in December 2020. It's 45 pages long, but I just picked out this one. 
And what it shows is that they have a strategic plan to move from their legacy of mature portfolios to their growth portfolio, as they phrase it. And their growth portfolio is to take advantage of all the new services that are being set up, such as Zoom, Zscaler, Cloud Skype, et cetera, Cisco. So they are moving into this um, much, this, this, the forefront, I think, of, of technological development as it comes to communications and IT. So a company that is valued at a price earnings of eight with a dividend of yield of five, if it is able to move anywhere up towards the sort of financial attractiveness of any of these companies over on the left-hand side, the share price will soar. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to soar, but I am saying that it is probably significantly undervalued from this point. It has possibly the appearance of just breaking out. And I think that it has potential to uh, go significantly higher over the course of the next couple of years. And I put my money where my mouth is and I bought some this week. Very good. Well, actually, Richard, I think this is a very interesting idea. As I have to say that I had basically not got BT even on my radar screen um, because I just had it in the category of dogs I wanted to avoid. But I hadn't really looked at the share price in a very long time. Um, now, so and you're absolutely right about BT Broadband because actually I'm on BT Broadband. We used to be on Virgin and BT is much better. And actually we're very happy with it. Um, but, okay, let me just push back though. Sure. Um, so they have cut the dividend by a long way. So I'm actually looking at the company on Stockopedia now. Mm -hmm. So the dividend used to be 15.4 P yeah. And they've cut it to they've cut it by seventy percent. So the dividend yield, um, which is five point two now, is on the expectation that they'll be able to raise that again to seven and a half in twenty twenty two. Um, but they would have a dividend cover of two and a half. And um, when you say that the um, the it's only on was it like a. 30 percent of assets yeah i mean in this so, day and age how, how relevant to assets do you think well i, I agree with you. So probably a lot of their assets are, are the legacy assets that they wish to move out of but nevertheless they've got they have a vast infrastructure on which they can gear up their their plan move into more technologically difficult areas and so i take your point but if you were to try and rebuild what they have now that would be extraordinarily difficult. And I don't know, actually, I, I don't know um, BT's cash flows in detail, but one would assume that the legacy assets are providing them with a sustainable, positive cash flow on which they can, they can start to build the new business that they want to be developing. And they well, have... hmm. The other thing I'd say is if you look on um, the forecast set revenues, forecast revenues are forecast to essentially continue declining, but profits are expected to recover. So what you're saying that BT will have to, in order to deliver any value, BT will have to, to execute yes. this change in strategy. We'll have to execute. So the falling in, fall in revenue is basically the fall in revenue from legacy assets, which has been happening for many years, hasn't it? Yeah. You know, fixed line and so forth. And yes, this, is, this, this investment is dependent upon their being able to execute the change in strategy. But I think I, what I like is the share price is depressed. The dividend is actually now well covered. Yes. Um, now, what is the debt? Because historically, it had enormous levels of debt. So net debt is 19 billion. That's not good. <laughs> it's, it's very heavily geared, basically. It's this heavy. is, uh, yeah. So let's hope interest rates don't go up, please. 
Well, exactly. <laughs> okay, so in summary, I think uh, the share price is depressed and it does have a turnaround plan, which I think that, um, like me, I think the market is largely forgotten about BT. Mm. Um, it has been a serial underperformer for years, but if it does manage to, to execute this turnaround plan, then the shares could fly because it, it does does have the ability to raise the dividend if it can maintain profits. Yes. Okay, so shall I do my one? Yes, please, Keith. So where we have both made money in the last couple of months is in clean technology companies, but they've all shot through the roof. Their share price is now really elevated and to my, I've really struggled chasing the, um, these companies and trying to buy them on ridiculous P ratios. So my ideal investment would be a clean energy company whose share price is depressed and the company is slightly forgotten. Right. Enter Tecmar. OK, so what Tecmar does is undersea cabling. Now, it used to mainly service the oil and gas sector but it has switched into servicing the pipelines and electric cabling for wind farms and this next chart which comes from their annual report shows all the stuff they do and it's absolutely extraordinary and it really i haven't realized how much other stuff there is attached to a um a, an offshore wind farm mm -hmm. um so i mean and i had to look up what some of this stuff is and so just out of interest what is a scour mat anti-scour fond uh fond mattress so scouring is do you see top left here so when you put the um wind turbine in the um, currents tend to sweep away the sand from around the base, which obviously weakens the um, foundations. So in order to prevent that, you have to have these uh, anti-scour frond mattresses, etc., etc., to stop the um, sand from being moved away. So all this stuff, and in particular undersea cabling, um, is what Tecmar does. Fascinating. Yeah. And so um, you see that it is now 70% offshore wind mm -hmm. and only about a third oil and gas. And as we expect oil and gas to recover, um, that is also potentially positive, but a lot of offshore wind... Um, investment has been delayed by covid but if you look at the forecasts there's a lot of offshore wind coming online so if you look at um the revenues of the company um this year i mean it's been okay but uh, a lot of um projects have been delayed essentially but going forwards they have a rich uh, pipeline but they what i wanted to emphasize is they've got cash they've got no debt they've got cash Okay, and they've got um, a historically a decent return on capital employed. So, um, so where's the share price? Well, this is what I like. The share price is depressed. Mm -hmm. Market cap, 33 and a half million. So, so Richard, can I sell you some tech bar? <laughs> could you go back to the um, financial table, please, Keith? So market cap of 30 million? Yes. So um, operating profit of 2 million. The, um, it's noticeable that their operating margin is, is declining. And do, yeah. do you know why that is? Uh, no, honestly, I don't. <laughs> so the, if the margin is declining, is, the question, I guess, is, is the margin going to continue to decline? Is it because of competition? Is it because they've got their costings wrong? Is it, 
I don't don't know. Well, they have uh, they have been investing in um, so they they claim to be number one in various segments, but they have competitors. Do they? So they have been investing in the new um, versions of their existing technology, and they this year they are currently implementing version 10 which is going into production now right and that will be cheaper than the existing version better performing but slightly cheaper although the margins will be the same so it seems to me keith that it's a very interesting idea and i had no idea about the complexity of the sub sub c um equipment for the for wind farms um it seems to me that the um, the critical thing here is can they increase their margins, and what is it that's going to stop them from increasing their margins? So we have we have two worlds in the investment, two two, two um, universes in the investment world. There's there's the the universe which consists of companies that are valued on the basis of I don't know what, uh, but it's it some immense multiple of sales and we have traditional companies that, well companies are valued on a traditional basis of, a, of a, you know, 10 times earnings or whatever and it, it seems to me that for Telmark to be successful there needs there would need to be a re-rating of the valuation of its earnings well you would <laughs> hope that the um the margins are currently depressed because they have um, sales have been depressed by COVID. So you've had various um, wind, offshore wind farms which are due to go into operation and those have been delayed um, and they've geared up to um, build like version 10 of their subsea cabling which has increased costs so this is a temporary um, depression in margin and when sales pick up again then um, the margins will recover so if they're able to increase their margins back up to 10 percent that would give a double a roughly doubling of profit if they can get a re-rating on the basis of, of that and maybe knock a couple of their competitors out then you can see the share price could, could be significantly higher in a couple of years time well, very interesting, Keith. On a on a highly naive uh, investment basis, which is, let's face it, how I like to look at things, it, the um, share price used to be one pound seventy four last cycle. It's sixty four p now. It's a growth industry. It's obvious. It's a no brainer, Keith. I agree. It's a no brainer. So, yeah. We don't like we don't like the difficult investment in, in this podcast, Richard. We like the easy ones. So, in, on that well, basis, yeah. thank you very much. This game was very difficult. interesting. So, on that note, right into the next section is my worst trade. And Richard will now talk us through his worst trade, or one of one of them. <laughs> one, one of the many. Thank you, Keith. So my worst trade I made in 1987 or 1988. Well, the one I'm going to talk to you about, I've made many since. It was a company called Butte Mining. And Butte Mining was... Uh, I came across it reading a Sunday newspaper. Now, I forget which one it was. And it was in a share pick article of a Sunday newspaper. And I was in my uh, late 20s at the time and pretty new to investing. And I thought, a gold miner in a Sunday newspaper, what's not to like? So I bought some shares <laughs> in Butte Mining. And I... I clearly I lost all my money and this has always sat in the back of my mind but I've never actually researched precisely what the problem was until now and I thought well this is the opportunity so I dug in today and I pulled this information out so reduced to its essentials the complaint alleges a conspiracy lasting four years in which Butte wow. Mining's promoters and initial shareholders 
exchange the interest they held in certain mining properties for excessive amounts of Butte mining stock. It's also alleged the defendants wrongfully diverted corporate asset, assets for their own benefits. And there were 78 defendants named in the 89 page complaint, including the initial shareholders, promoters, and an array of corporations. So clearly this is a fraudulent company. Wow. And it went to court. And in sentencing, at the end of an 11 month trial, the judge said, the degree of dishonesty involved is so serious and far reaching that it constitutes a flagrant disregard of the law specifically designed to protect investors. The moral of the story for me, uh, Keith, is simply don't invest on the basis of what a financial journalist suggests without understanding fully why they've recommended it. Very sound advice. Do your own research. Exactly. But so this is really interesting. So was anyone sent to jail? Yes, three people. Three people were jailed. Right. But between, I think, three and five years. So do you think, looking back in, in retrospect, that there were cell signals which would have allowed you to get out? And why didn't you get out? Well, I think there are a few things. Back in 1987, it was before the internet even. So the only right. way you could monitor your share price was in the daily, well, yes, was in the daily columns of the, of the newspapers. Of course. Um, I, was, I was a very naive investor, uh, undoubtedly. And I, I probably looked at it every month or something like that. And I suspect, uh, I, I did actually look to see whether I could see a, a record of the share price. I couldn't find one easily. Um, mm. I suspect that it basically just disappeared off the quotations shortly after I right. invested. Um, and I never, I never, clearly I never got my money back. I never had any communication from anybody. Yeah. Uh, presumably once it went bust, the administrators decided they weren't going to communicate with the shareholders because it would have cost yeah. money. Yeah. And uh, it was just an unfortunate, um, quite expensive at the time lesson. Yes. Well, I think the thing about speculations is that you should be aware of their speculations and monitor them very closely. I mean, which is obviously much easier now yeah. than it was then. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, I exactly. think so. at the start of all our investment careers, there is a whole load of nasties. So um, it, anyway, was a sort of, um, it was a sort of equivalent of the boiler shop. I remember a few years ago, I, I got rung up by what I assume must be a boiler shop. And they were very, very well-spoken, sort of sounded very educated, very... Um, first of all, and said, so someone of your financial standing and of your knowledge must must be aware this is an, event, an opportunity of a lifetime, and so forth. And it's so easy to get suckered into these things, isn't it? I didn't get suckered into that. But. Like you, I get occasional calls from the from these uh, bucket shops, and I think the the number one rule for all our both our viewers is um, that. Um, don't ever invest on the basis of a phone call. Absolutely, yeah, that's it. So what is your uh, worst trade this week, Keith? Um, well, actually, Richard, I, I'm thankful to say that I don't have enough worst trades to be doing one every week. So I think we're going to do <laughs> one worst, your worst trade, and then next week I'll do another one of mine. Fair enough, Keith. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't mean, mean to impugn your investing capacity. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfectly all right it's an understandable mistake to make right. anyway so moving on <laughs> shall we do my uh, next one then <laughs> yeah. shall we do your um richard knows a lot about uh covid19 we're going to do a quick update on um developments this week and where we are do you want to do that yes thank you keith i i don't know a lot about it but i have been i do keep up with um developments in a, in a general sense. So Keith, I really just wanted to talk about a, a couple of things today regarding the COVID virus. And the one, one of the things I want to do is I'd like to bring up the uh, a image of the spike protein. So the spike protein is what we hear all about. It's the thing that sticks out from the virus and engages with the cells that the virus invades. And 
these are computer generated pictures of, of, a, of a single pro spike protein molecule from two different perspectives. And it consists of 1,000, roughly 1,200 amino acids joined together in a single chain that folds on itself as it is produced and creating this very complex uh, interwoven folding structure. And a lot of that structure is inside and cannot be, um, cannot be accessed uh, by um, an antibody. And some of it is on the outside. So the outside is, 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 is what, what is actually available to the body to develop an antibody against this, this protein. So that is what the vaccine is able to mimic and mimic the infection. And recently we've been hearing about mutations and you can see if you have 1200 amino acids and this complex structure, you can see that a mutation may or may not change the structure at all. It may or may not change the structure of a site that an antibody recognizes. And, but it is so large that it is bound to mutate regularly and continually change. The other point, of course, is that because it can mutate easily and can create changes in the structure of this molecule, it, there is a natural selection advantage to a virus that has a structure that is less susceptible to our immune system, to, to the vaccine. And those variants, those mutated variants of the virus will be the ones that move through the population at any given point. Mm. So. The good news at the moment is that the variants that we've discovered in South Africa and the UK appear to be susceptible to the Pfizer vaccine still. In other words, the active sites on the Pfizer vaccine that create the antibodies are not mutated to the point where the antibodies aren't effective. The less good news is that probably in due course there will be mutations that mean that the current vaccines don't work. And we will have to produce new vaccines and that new vaccine will have to be put in presumably to the existing vaccine mix to provide immunity against future variants. What this really means is it turns it into something like the flu vaccination problem where every year we have new flu, a new flu vaccine for a new flu strain. The vaccine contains, um, that works against a number of different strains and we are likely, I think, for the next few years to have to vaccine, vaccinate regularly against new strains of the mutation, new strains of, of the COVID-19 virus, which is going to have an ongoing effect on the health service and potentially on the economy, but at a much, one would hope at a much lower level than the current level of, of uh, than the current degree by which we're all being affected. So that's really what I wanted to just talk mm -hmm. about. Well, thank you, Richard. That's uh, very interesting. Those spike um, protein um, molecule charts were astonishing. It's, made, it's amazing um, the level of computer imaging and the fact we can now um, sti simulate the uh, folding structures of these proteins. Amazing. Um, but the overall message, frankly, is a bit depressing. I really don't want to be in this lockdown forever. <laughs> I think it's important anyway. to try and be realistic, but also optimistic. Yeah. I think, uh, Matt Hancock referred to this in his parliamentary appearance yesterday before the Health Committee. But Keith, right. I think we are going to move on now and you're going to do a book review, aren't you? Right, so book reviews will be uh, an occasional feature of this podcast. Um, we don't uh, guarantee to do one every week, but we do both read quite a lot about books about financial markets. And I have literally today finished a book called John Law by James Buchan. Now. Mm -hmm. So tell us, tell us about that, Keith. What, what, what is the essence of the book? OK, so. Right, John Law, some of you may know, essentially 
developed the first modern scheme of paper money in Europe in 1720s France. Um, and there is one, and the reason I'm reading this book is because he, uh, because of all the money printing going on. And needless to say, his first experiment with money printing in France did not end well. And there's one lesson I take away from this book, which I would like to say now and reiterate at the end. And that is when central banks and governments lose control of the monetary process, they can largely contain the effects within the country because they can mandate laws for the use of the currency and they can suppress monetary substitutes like gold and silver. But what they can't do is suppress the external effects. So the first sign of um, a failure in confidence in the national currency is seen in the external markets in the exchange rate and there's nothing they can do. So the first sign that the new monetary experiment in France was failing was a de steadily declining exchange rate. Okay, so the um, John Law was a Scottish gentleman who um, had been thinking for many years about the nature of money. And so what happens when you exchange a gold coin for um, a musket, let's say? You, the, the value is in the exchange. It's not necessarily in the gold coin. You could uh, transfer a note of credit, a piece of paper for that musket, as long as the person was willing to exchange that musket for the piece of paper. He had, the piece of paper had credibility. And John Law sent, he thought that you could massively increase the supply of money and therefore of industry by substituting gold and silver for a paper currency. And he first came to London with this scheme. And we tried in Scotland, got no, got in, tried in London, also failed to uh, really get traction. And also he ended up in a duel in, in what is now Bloomsbury Square in which he killed a man okay. and was thrown into prison. And uh, the, um, in those days, pr prisons were private affairs. So essentially, believe it or not, you were let out for lunch. <laughs> you had to pay, <laughs> and like, you were let out in parole to go and get your lunch. <laughs> so essentially this is court case dragged on for a while until with the connivance of various other parties, he escaped and went to the continent where France at that time had a new young king, Louis XV, who was too young to rule on his own. And so there was a regency and he had in, inherited vast amounts of debt. And essentially France was al almost bankrupt. So it was willing to experiment with new monetary regimes. So John Law then set up a um, national bank. Mm -hmm. He instituted a paper currency, which was backed by gold and silver. And that was a success. Um, but then the big part of the scheme for which he is mainly remembered is at the same time, France had claimed large tracts of America um, around Louisiana. And he set up um, the Mississippi Company to exploit trade with America. Now, obviously there was no trade with America at that stage because there was only a tiny and impoverished colony. But with the um, hope that there would be trade, he set up this company. And his idea was that 
you could, instead of having a vast national debt as France had, you could substitute um, commerce. So you could have commercial companies trading with the new world who would pay and the dividends would be would pay off part of the national debt. So he um, floated the Mississippi company and the shares, there are 50,000 shares issued in 1719 and the shares had a 500 livre um, face value. But to buy a share, to subscribe to a share, you only had to put down 75 livre. And then you, once you'd subscribed and you put down your 75 livre, you then had to pay 25 per month thereafter. But if you think about it, what he's done is on day one, he's created financial assets worth 500 livre for only 75 livre. So he's massively increased the stock of financial assets on day one. Yep. So he's enormously increased the money supply. So you can use these as um, collateral for loans, etc. So the bottom line is in two years, he doubled the money supply of France. And that shows up in inflation. And well, frankly, this book is not written by an economist and a lot of the uh, financial details are not very well described. So, I mean, really, if you're interested in this, I would recommend um, looking at the Wikipedia article, etc., for details of how the Mississippi scheme operated. Needless to say, that a de bubble developed in the um, market for shares in the Mississippi scheme, which went from its initial 500 leave share price to a high of 15,000, and it sucked in the whole of Europe. Britain was so jealous of France's success because everyone was spending money. The, the uh, country appears incredibly affluent um, that they developed the South Sea Company. Oh, the South Sea opposition. Bubble. Yes. Um, and Holland, in turn, attempted to copy it as well. So initially, this seemed just like a marvellous idea. Um, but of course, when the share price peaked, people began to lose confidence in the Mississippi scheme and also in all John Law's schemes, including the bank and the uh, paper money. Mm -hmm. So originally the mo paper money was backed by gold and was convertible into gold. So insiders so that some of the nobility started to cash their shares in for gold and that of course is a disaster that's a right massive, bank piece. precisely so the first thing you do and this is why i'm interested in this book is that when people start to lose um confidence in the currency what can this the government do to um in to try and um maintain financial credibility well the first thing they did was they stopped convertibility so you couldn't change your, your paper notes into gold and silver mm -hmm. they mandated the use of paper currency All right they then banned the export of gold and silver on pain of death um but all of this of course smacks of desperation yeah. and does nothing to restore confidence. So what you see is the exchange rate collapsed. Yeah. And actually, when you say it collapsed, people, foreigners just refuse to accept paper money. So eventually this leads to just collapse. He is sent into exile. The um, whole scheme um, fails and they have to re-establish the uh, previous hard money. Now, but what's interesting is that when the, all this paper money is in circulation and is devalued, of course, the first thing people do is try and repay their debts 
in this devalued paper before hard currency comes in. Yeah. So essentially, bonds, and we're talking about bonds now, people repay their bonds. Bonds were a disastrous investment, and this destroyed the wealth of the middle classes. But actually, it was quite good for the king in that he had managed to write off a huge chunk of his debts. Well, this is inflation. Inflation benefits the creditor. Precisely. Yes. So there you go. Um, would so I would recommend, recommend this book? Would you recommend reading it or would you just recommend reading about John Law? I Honestly, 420 pages, mainly about the man, a bit too much detail and not detail on what I, the bits I wanted to know about. I wanted to know about the um, financial aspects of the scheme and there's not really that much in that. So um, if interested, look yeah. up the financial aspects of John Law's scheme in France and, and the Mississippi bubble. Yes. Would be your conclusion. Precisely. But um, I would reiterate that governments can control the um, use of the currency within the country. So if we have a lot of money printing and inflation starts to pick up, the government would be able to control long-term interest rates. But what it can't do is make the foreigners exchange this currency. So you'd ex the first signs you'd see are in a declining exchange rate and the government would not be able to keep the exchange rate up. Very interesting, Keith. So we must keep our, a close eye on what's happening with, it, with the major exchange rates around the world. Yes, of course, the trouble is, Richard, that all the governments of the world are currently printing like mad. So, I mean, I, so I all you could do then is measure the exchange rate against gold, Keith, or Bitcoin. I don't actually advocate Bitcoin, but you can measure it against gold. Precisely, yeah. And uh, against gold, you know, $32 an ounce in 1972 when Nixon took us off the gold standard. Yeah. One thousand nine hundred dollars now. And most currencies near near at a, or near an all time high against gold. So thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed our first episode. Um, if you have any comments, I hope you will send them to info at portfoliomatters.co.uk. The uh, details are in the uh, text at the bottom of our uh, YouTube channel. Um, if you have a worst trade that you would like to share with us, then we would love to hear it and please get in touch. Um, we will be posting uh, thoughts every week and I hope you'll join us on an ongoing basis and what promises to be an absolutely extraordinary year in markets. Um, if you enjoyed this, please can you press like and subscribe to the channel. It would be nice to have more than two viewers and I count Richard and I as those viewers. Um, and um, so all we may say is goodbye from Richard Wheater. And goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. Goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.